common sense. This is the most common refrain that I hear from proponents of increasing gun control in the wake of uh, these mass shootings. And I think that that's actually a really good place to start. This is, for some reason, an extremely contentious debate with a lot of acrimony and a lot of talking past each other. More so than it seems like it should be. There are other things that, quite frankly, are more important. There are things that cause more death than guns, than homicide. There's all kinds of health issues, whether it's obesity or cancer. There's the war. There's civil liberties. There's a whole host of things, economic problems, that any honest appraisal is going to say that's that's very likely at least as bad. But you don't get the same amount of vitriol. You don't get the same amount of of acrimony and it's just anger and hatred and vitriol and if you are against me you're evil and if you're for me you're you know great patriot whatever uh, reasonable and I think that approaching it from a common sense perspective is comes from a good place and so I want to try and do that so for those who whose reaction who has a who have a visceral reaction and I know that you do because I I read it and I understand you hear you hear about a, a tragedy like this you hear about a a horrible crime with lots of people getting gunned down and killed and you just can't fathom why this is even a debate why there's even anyone who could in good faith question increasing government regulations and controls if not complete bans and confiscations of firearms within the United States. So let me try and use a little common sense here. First of all, if you're worried about being killed in a mass shooting or in just a, a gun homicide or a homicide generally, because I think it's uh, philosophically not that big a difference between murder through the various different means but if, if that's something that you're really worried about does it make sense to take steps to def if, if the only steps you take to defend yourself are to suggest that there be new government regulations is that going to do you very much good is a is the spread of background checks to include all private purchases is that going to do very much to make you safe is the banning of certain types of firearms going to do very much to keep you safe between now and the time any of that can even happen there would have to be legislation it would have to go through both houses of congress it would have to be signed by the president it would have to make it past the nra and the gop it would have to be instituted and then it would have to be effective. In the meantime, what are you going to do? Does it make sense if you're worried about it, if, if you are concerned for your safety, that the extent of your preparation for that potentiality, and it's an admittedly a very small one, but if you're really concerned about it, if it really bothers you, you should do more than simply hope that a new legislative policy will be affected at some point and also further hope that it will be effective at protecting you. This would be sort of like someone who's really concerned with heart disease or diabetes or any, other, any number of other health ailments uh, that you can have from having an unhealthy lifestyle. Uh, ailments, by the way, that are going to kill many thousands more, many times more people than guns, whether you count suicides or not, uh, homicides, everything. It doesn't make sense if you're worried about your health, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, to only go so far as to post on Facebook or on Twitter how much you think the government should regulate, you know, health, how much it should uh, 
maybe subsidize healthy food or, or gym memberships or how much it should um, restrict unhealthy foods? Is that really an effective means of pre preparing yourself to survive an unhealthy lifestyle? Would it not make more sense to personally start eating healthy? Wouldn't make more sense to personally join a gym or start walking or running or doing some research if you're not sure what to do to figure out what steps you can take as a person right now to make your health better. Isn't that more likely to yield results at all? I mean, there's no guarantee that any legislation will happen because of this. And maybe you think that's wrong or whatever, but that's just common sense, the fact, the truth. And maybe even if it did get passed, it's not that obvious how much it's going to protect you. So if you're worried about your health, you should take steps to make yourself more healthy you shouldn't it does it make sense to vest the the personal you know outcomes of your life on legislation i don't think that it does the amount of control you have over that process is infinitesimal the amount of sway that process has over your life is minimal in most cases and if you're talking about your personal outcomes whether they be health or safety or whatever relying on on the government is not common sense so if you're really worried about gun violence and your safety there are things you can do first of all gun violence in the united states isn't homogeneously spread over the entire country there are many places in the united states where gun violence and all violence for that matter are very alien and very very rare as rare if not rarer than any place else in the world, including the most gun restrictive places in Europe. And there are places in the United States where homicide is very high, where crime is very high, where gun homicide is very high. And if you're really concerned about your safety, then those are probably places that you should avoid. And you can look into which states and what, what counties and whatever. Uh, just, I've done a little looking if you're curious, the cities to avoid because they have the highest per capita gun homicide, even though I think I looked gun homicide, but you could, these would be probably pretty close to just homicide generally are East St. Louis, Illinois, Camden, New Jersey, Gary, Indiana, Chester, Pennsylvania, Saginaw, Flinton, Detroit, Michigan. Way to go, Michigan. Trenton, New Jersey, New Orleans, Newark, and that's the top 10. And then we got Harvey, Illinois, St. Louis, Missouri, Baltimore, Maryland, Compton, California, and East Chicago to round out the top 15. So outside of those places, and there's a couple other, if you go a little bit further down the list, you're going to get D.C., you're going to get San Bernardino, you're going to get Chicago. If you're really concerned about being killed in some kind of shooting, then those are places to avoid or to minimize your exposure to. If you have to live in them or buy them, be aware. And if you walk out of those places, if you stay away from those places, the odds that you're ever going to be a victim of a crime involving a gun, or any crime for that matter, dramatically drop. And you can do more for your safety by that than anything else. But that's not the only thing. Maybe you have to live in those areas. Maybe you don't want to move. And you know what? I don't think you should have to change your lifestyle um, you know, that much. So there are other things you can do. You can simply raise your situational awareness. Most people go around and they are in what's called the white zone. They're basically oblivious. They're not paying attention to what's going on. They're not uh, looking at other people, their body movements. doesn't mean you're suspicious. It doesn't mean you're paranoid. It just means that you're aware. This is actually one of the main reasons people get in car accidents. They're driving on the car, even if they're not inebriated, even if they're not texting they're just comfortable, they're cozy, it's warm, and they just blank out, and next thing you know, they rear-end someone. You'll never rear-end someone if you're paying attention. And if you're paying, if you have situational awareness, you say situation awareness, what are you talking about? This is what the military teaches, this is what soldiers have, you know, and there's different zones, there's a, it, I, it goes from, you're completely at ease, all the way up to high stress, you're you know, razor's edge, heightened sense, senses, fight or flight. You don't want to be in that all the time. That's bad for your health to do that all the time. If you start hearing gunfire and you think there might be a shooting, yeah, you go into that zone for a little bit until you're safe. But you at least 
want to raise your situational awareness. You don't want to be complacent. Being complacent is never going to make you safer. Now, if you don't think that's good enough, you can take other defensive measures, all right? You can learn how to run. Flight is a perfectly legitimate thing you can try and do. Uh, if you're a fast runner, if you're a good jumper, if you're a good climber, you have options that other people might. And if you're really, really worried about getting shot or killed, consider how to flee. Consider what it takes to flee. You can also, if you want, buy body armor. It's perfectly legal. You can't kill anyone with body armor. You can't use it to hurt anyone else, but you can buy it and you can wear it. Now, it's heavy. It's bulky. Your friends and coworkers are probably going to start wondering why you're wearing sweaters and sweatshirts all the time. Uh, but you can do it, and it definitely will increase your survivability in the case that you are attacked with someone with a gun. Definitely. Is it foolproof? No. Is it really rational considering how likely it is that you're going to be killed and are uh, confronted with the situation? Hmm. Cost-benefit analysis? No, although maybe it has uh, side effects like you're in better shape because you're walking around with 20 pounds of Kevlar and steel plates or ceramic plates. Well, that's something you can do. You can go online right now and you can buy body armor. No one will stop you and you can start wearing it. Or if you don't want to wear it all the time, you just wear it when you go to St. Louis or Camden or Gary. Uh, you know, is that maybe a little paranoid? Maybe, but it's your safety and it's something that you can do. But the other thing that you can do is you can buy a gun and you can learn how to use it. Because that can save your life too. When you have shooters who are intent on murder, the, and in not just murdering a particular person, but as many people as possible, the only thing that's going to stop them is somebody resisting them. And you can resist without a gun. We saw at the train, uh, the terrorist in Belgium and France who was attempting to shoot up a train, he was resisted by passengers, all of whom were disarmed, but they were able to tackle him. Uh, luckily for them, his AK-47 jammed. Um, resistance is your best option if you can't flee. However, resistance with your body or with uh, you know, a pencil or a desk or a book versus resistance with a gun, let's use common sense again on this. What would you rather have? You're, you're on a train or in a room in an office building or a school and a mass shooting is taking place and you can't flee or it'd be difficult to flee, or perhaps you don't even know wh which way you should or should not flee. Are you going to feel better knowing that you have a 9mm pistol on your person? Or if you voted for Dianne Feinstein and support the Brady campaign, which one is going to make you feel safer in that case? Common sense, which one is going to give you a better chance of resisting an attacker? Is, is a gun going to give you a better chance of doing that? And the answer is yes, of course it is. Now, is a gun perfect? Is a gun guaranteed to protect you? Is a gun a magic shield that makes it so that you can't be harmed? Of course it's not. Of course it's not. There is no such thing that exists anywhere. You could be in prison and still be killed. You could be in your home, sleeping in bed with you know multiple locked doors and still be killed somehow or another. But a gun gives you an option. Now, you can always create hypothetical situations, increasingly absurd ones in many cases, whereby you having a gun turns out bad. Sure, and that can happen, but also can turn out well. And if you are doubting this, you can look at the research, of course. You can read Gary Kleck, who's done all kinds of research on the deterrent effects of guns and the number of times guns are used in self-defense in the United States, and the number is huge. It's in the hundreds of thousands, and that's at the bare minimum. It's probably in the millions. Even the Brady campaign to prevent gun violence admits it's in the hundreds of thousands. Um, and in most of those cases, the gun is never used. But they're not never fired. It's simply brandished. But if you don't want to look at all the data, if that's something that isn't going to have a visceral effect, 
on how you feel about it, then you can just go on YouTube and you can type guns save lives and you can watch videos of people using guns in self-defense successfully. And you can spend the rest of your day today and tomorrow and the rest of the week watching that tiny sliver of incidents that both get recorded and posted and that you happen to find. And how many are you going to have to watch before you admit this is something that can work? Even many liberals will understand this and admit this. Sam Harris, who is not my favorite person in the world, admits this all the time and has written articles about it. And I wouldn't be surprised if he writes another one after, his, after what's happened, if he hasn't already. And one thing you'll notice when you watch these videos, and I've done it, I don't do it all the time. I don't take pleasure in watching stuff like that. But it is instructive. If you want to see what actual life and death encounters can be like, what it's actually like, well, that's a good way to do it. Don't do it by watching a Hollywood movie. Don't do it by concocting in an imagination of yourself what's going to happen. Watch videos of it happening and see how it goes down. And one thing you'll notice, most of the people that you'll see, they're not the white, middle-class, cowboy, rich boy, NRA life member that you're going to imagine. And the reason is that those people that you're, that stereotype, and it is a stereotype, they don't live in general in areas where there's high crime. They don't have to defend themselves with near the frequency of people who are poor and who live in urban centers and who tend to be minorities. And most of the people you're going to watch, they're going to be black and Hispanic. They're going to be South and East Asian store owners. And when they get faced with a criminal who threatens them with death, with a weapon, or not even, they fight back with a gun. And it doesn't always work out, but sometimes it does, many times, thousands of times. And it's effective, and you can watch that. And you can look at a person like that. And what, what do you say when you see a person, when you see a, a, a poor African-American who lives in the inner city? who can't afford to move outside of Flint or Saginaw, who can't afford to leave, not work in a bad neighborhood. Those are people who realize that their safety was not well served by simply going onto Facebook and spreading the Slate or a Huffington Post article or a Salon article. These are people who thought that their safety wasn't really going to be helped by retweeting something from a Hollywood comedian uh, or by reading uh, a front page op-ed in the New York Times talking about how they shouldn't even be allowed to own a gun. These are people who said my life and my safety is this important and I'm going to take steps to protect it and they bought a gun and they did. And what's ironic is that advocating that, tho that those these are people who have actually taken steps to defend themselves and have done so. Most of what's advocated is going to either make it more difficult for them to do that or actually make it criminal. And does that make sense? Is that a common sense approach? How good is regulations and restrictions that raise the cost, how good is that going to affect the inner city people who need these guns? right? Common sense. So think about that and watch those videos. And if, and if you can't, if you don't want to watch them, then please don't deny that they happen. It's not credible to say that they're never used in self-defense. It's a legitimate question to ask how much and what we have are estimates. And I mentioned Gary Kleck because he's the premier criminologist in this area, but there have been many, many other studies done by other people besides him, and they seem to narrow in on similar numbers, which are basically probably fair estimates, and they're in the low millions. So bear that in mind as you're considering this. Okay, so many of you are going to say, though, yes, personal, personal protection, 
what you can do yourself, that's fine. But I really want, let's talk about policy. I, what, what policies can we do? It's not enough. It's too selfish to just ask what I can do for myself. Most of you who are going to see this, most of, of you are probably not in a position where it's very likely for you to face the specter of a violent gun death. And you probably know that. And so you're not going to go buy body armor, you're not going to go buy a gun, and you're not going to learn how to use it. And you probably don't need to do any of those things, because probably you're going to be perfectly safe anyway. So you want, let's talk about policy then. Let's talk about policy. Now, here's something. Human society is very, very complex. There are 300 and, what, 10, 20 million people in the United States different ideologies, different economics, different social classes, different urban environments, rural environments, a long history, all kinds of things. It's empirically almost impossible to judge, and not just for gun control, for anything, for economics, for poverty. There's great disagreement on almost any social issue that you can raise. And for that reason, it's probably good to be hesitant before just doing something this impulse, we need to do something, we need to do something. It's not always a good idea to just do something without having a really good idea if it's going to work or not, or what the effect is going to be. For instance, if you, I've had, you know, who hasn't had a friend at one point tell them that they were feeling sick, that they, they didn't feel well, maybe they felt nauseous, maybe they felt uh, a fever. Well, you want to help your friend or you want to help yourself. Would it make sense to be like, well, we don't really know what the problem is, but we can't just do nothing. Let's pull out an X-Acto knife and just start cutting you up. And hopefully maybe we'll find out what the problem is and we can make it better. Is that common sense? No, of course not. Of course not. You are not likely to solve the problem, and you are very likely to make things much worse. You could even kill the person. And why is that? Well, it's because the human body is a very complex thing, because it's a very intricate mechanical system. And even doctors, even people who are experts, often aren't sure what's best to do. Often it's better to just sit back. And if you aren't an expert, then you should definitely not. Now, when it comes to gun control and criminology, who are the experts? Well, there are experts in particular fields, but there are no people who are so qualified that they can say for sure what's best for everyone. And I know the common sense thing here is it goes, oh no, we know. We know for sure what the problem is. It's that guns are legal and that they're re readily available in the United States. We know this. This is, this is not something that can be debated. Really? Really? And what normally is done is we'll compare the United States and we'll pick a dozen other countries, you know, the UK, Japan, Luxembourg, France, Germany, and we'll say, look, they all have strict gun control laws and they all have low homicide rates. Ergo, the United States unrestrictive laws cause high homicide rates. Well, that's both philosophically and empirically erroneous. For one, correlation does not equal causation. All right? That's a logical fallacy. Two, there isn't really correlation. You are not allowed empirically to just cherry pick the countries that you want and compare them. There are something around 200 countries in the, in the world. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to compare a country to, of the United States with, say, Luxembourg, but not with, say, Mexico or Russia or South uh, South Africa, right? I mean, how, how similar is Luxembourg or Sweden or the Netherlands to the United States compared to Argentina or Brazil or Mexico? If you go on the Wikipedia list of the countries with the highest homicide, or if you'd rather look at the list of the countries with the highest gun homicide, and you read them, the ones that have the most are not the United States. It's Jamaica and Honduras and El Salvador and Venezuela and Colombia and Brazil and Russia. And 
there's a long list. And one thing that those countries have in common is that none of them have a Second Amendment, none of them have an NRA, none of them have high gun ownership rates, and most of them have very restrictive laws, many times complete gun bans, and yet they have atrocious homicide, much worse than the United States. Brazil, Russia, Mexico, South, South America, excuse me, South Africa, Jamaica, and people say, well, that's what you can't compare those countries to the United States, well, but but you can compare Luxembourg. Um, but the but then the re replies, but though those countries have other things, there's other factors. There's poverty. There's you know uh, those are very heterogeneous societies. Um, they have uh, you know their third world. You know, well, why is it that that is an argument that can be used in their favor and say, oh, well, Jamaica, the fact that Jamaica has basically a complete gun ban isn't the reason they have high crime. They have high crime for other reasons. It's a small country. It's an island. Their government should be able to restrict guns, right? And yet they have a huge homicide rate with guns. Why, but then why isn't that argument, why can that excuse be used in the United States? I mean, people will say, well, you can't count Mexico because it has a war on drugs. Well, Mexico is not the only country that has a war on drugs. Right, so you're cherry picking and you're just saying, well, I'm deciding that I don't count these countries for these other reasons. In the case of comparing the United States and the United Kingdom, we know that the reason must be, it has to be, because of the difference in the gun laws, because there are no other differences between the United States and the United Kingdom. Except there are many differences between the United States and the United Kingdoms. And we actually know pretty much for certain, for logical certainty, that the reason the UK has lower homicide rates than the United States, and indeed it has much lower homicide rates than the United States, is not because of their restrict, restrictive gun laws. And how how can I be that sure to say that? That's an amazing. How, how can you know? You just said people don't know these things. Well, because the UK had low homicide rates before they ever had gun control. Right? If you have a place that has a very very low homicide rate and has for decades and one year they pass strict gun control and they were continue to have low homicide rates what is the evidence there the the low the low rates were clearly not caused by the gun control because they preceded the gun control you know if if the united nations declared the antarctica should have be a gun-free zone that no one should have guns in Antarctica and in the next three years no one was ever murdered in Antarctica would that be strong evidence that gun bans are effective no because there's never been a gun homicide in Antarctica at least not anytime soon in the last hundred years no and this is exactly the scenario that one finds in the UK they've always had low gun homicide and they've only, in the relative recent past, had more gun control. And their rates haven't fallen. They've stayed the same, and sometimes they went up. There was the Dumblane, the massive shooting in the 1995-1996. Massive gun control was passed. Gun, gun homicide actually increased very slightly. Not, not a dramatic, I mean, if you put the scale right, it looks dramatic, but it's a very small, in overall terms, increase. And then it came back down maybe five or six years later, back to the same level as that before. They still have mass shootings, by the way, in the UK. The Cumberland shooting in 2008 still managed to happen. You know, California has, among the very strictest gun laws in the United States, it still came to happen. France has very strict gun control laws. And they've had multiple mass shootings, not just this last one in Paris, but the Charlie Hebdo and others. The one on the train that was stopped. It wasn't a mass shooting because people stopped it. And they would have been much more likely to stop it had they had firearms. So the correlation causation is not actually there. There, there isn't a correlation. You know, and then you compare the United States to Japan as if the only difference between Japan and the United States are their gun laws. And even within the United States, the number of guns in the United States has increased dramatically. 
The high point of U.S. homicide was in 1993. Since that time, something like, close to, no one knows for sure, but something like 100 million new modern firearms have been bought and entered the, United, the American market. There's probably between 250 and 300 million guns in the United States. Most of them are going to be modern. Did crime go up in the United States in the last 20 years? No. It's gone down. Violent crime has gone down at least 40% despite the fact that there's more guns than ever. Common sense. Are guns causing crime to go up? It seems unlikely. It seems very unlikely. So, there's that element. Here's the other element. If we're talking about policy, does it make sense to focus on the smallest sliver of a category of action, right? If 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 there are eleven thousand gun homicides in the United States every year, does it make sense to focus on the twenty or thirty that happen in mass shootings? Right? This would be like we have an epidemic in the United States of car accidents. We do. Many more people die in car accidents than die in gun gun homicides. Some of those car accidents involve high end Italian sports cars like Lamborghinis and Maseratis. Does it make sense if we're going to address the problem, common sense, to address accidents involving Lamborghinis and Maseratis and not really worry about all the other ones? Because I, you don't see the vitriol. I don't see all the people getting upset and posting on Facebook and pulling out front page editorials in the New York Times because there's a high rate of gun homicide in Chicago or in Detroit or in Washington, D.C. Even though those, but what we do in these very specific events, but those specific events are statistically very, very small, tiny. I, I don't want to, I would say infinitesimal, except people would find that a little heartless. So I'm not going to say that because they're not infinitesimal. People died and that's a tragedy. It's a small sliver. It's a small, small sliver. Why is that the instigating event? Why is that the focus? These events are premeditated by people who are either, and I, I question the use of the term insane and all that, but these are often people who have a mental, a mindset anyway. That means they don't care if they die and they all they want is to maximize the number of people they can kill. Or there, you know, maybe it's ideological, like in the in the abortion shooting, uh, or the Planned Parenthood shooting, or in, in San Bernardino, this most recent one. If you watch this video in the future, the San Bernardino shootings have just happened like a week ago, a couple days ago. Um, what, in common sense, what is a background track going to do against these people? All of them attain their weapons legally. The, the what common sense gun control are you proposing that's going to stop that attack? That's what's upsetting you. That's what's infuriating. That's what's making you feel like there's such a problem. And so you're, let's do something. What is the something that's going to stop that? If you don't have a record, a background check will do nothing. If you're willing to die, and you're planning to kill, you don't care if they can trace the gun back to the place that you bought it. It doesn't matter. It, mean, it means nothing. If you're willing to kill, you're willing to kill someone who has a gun. If you, for some reason, can't, you're willing to murder somebody who does. You could get a straw purchase. I mean, you're willing to die. You can pull up the money to give a straw purchase, right? How many people have been arrested for straw purchasing a firearm? Ever looked at the numbers? Ever even heard of it happening? There's no way, no way, background checks can stop a premeditated attack like this. And say, well, we can, we can reduce the number of guns in society as a whole. Well, maybe you can reduce it from 300 million to 250 million, but I, I don't think you could. That's so we'd have the same number of guns that we had in 2002 
Um, well, wouldn't that be good? Well, who's that going to affect more? Is that going to affect the law-abiding citizens more? Or is that going to affect the criminals more? Common sense. Common sense. And people don't like to admit, but like disarming honest law-abiding citizens, non-violent people, decent people who have a moral compass, who are not going out and committing mass murders, disarming them is not going to reduce crime. It's going to remove a deterrent from crime. Think, of, think about, use your empathy. Use your ability to see in someone else's, from someone else's perspective. If you decide you want to murder people en masse, and you want to kill as many as possible, does it matter to you if your potential victims have guns or not? Does it matter? Let's be honest and say that it does. How many of these shootings happen at gun shows or NRA conventions? They're overwhelmingly happen in places where guns are specifically banned. Schools, churches, hospitals, movie theaters, in California, the open carry and concealed carry of firearms in most places, including in San Bernardino, is basically illegal. Every county in California has discretionary issue. And in some of the rural counties, you know, if you go up in the mountains and men's and are on the border with Nevada, some of those sheriffs will grant concealed carry permits. But not in Orange County, not in San Diego County, not in any of the counties along the coast. They don't grant them to anyone. Some of those counties, with millions of people in them, have two, three people who have been approved to have concealed carry permits. That means that statistically, no one has a concealed carry permit. They have every expectation of not being confronted by anyone when they do an attack there. Not so if they go to a Walmart in Texas. Not so if they go on some main street in Pennsylvania or Ohio. Or Vermont <laughs> because concealed carry happens and it's not that uncommon in fact in some places it's quite common and it makes a difference again put yourself in the position of a victim are you honestly going to say that you not having a handgun versus having a handgun is completely irrelevant that it means nothing that it has no po yes hypothetically you could still be killed yes hypothetically you might accidentally kill somebody else sure it could happen lots of things could ha happen you also could kill the person who's perpetrating the mass shooting, and it does happen. It's hard to quantify because if you stop a mass shooter, you may prevent something from becoming a mass shooting, although apparently things that involve BB guns and a single fatality are now considered mass shootings according to much of the stuff that's getting spread around there shared and said, oh, look, we have a mass shooting every day, according to who? Well, a, rub, a subreddit, apparently. But that's going to make a difference. The, the, the regulation that you favor, it's going to make it harder for people to get guns, which is going to hurt poor people the most. It's going to hurt the shop owners at the 7-Elevens and in the inner city, the poor people who can't leave and move to the burbs, who can't afford to pay $100 a year for the lifetime NRA membership. It's going to hurt them. It's going to remove potential resistance from would-be victims of all types of criminals. And yeah, maybe it will be a little bit harder to get for criminals to get guns, but then it'll be a lot easier for them to attack victims. And so what's the net effect? What's the net effect? Do you know? Are you sure? And here's the other thing. Do you have the right to tell someone they should be restricted, they should be disbarred, prevented, regulated, stopped from doing something, from owning something peacefully, who they've never harmed you, they've never done anything? Should you be allowed to do that when you're not even sure if what you're proposing will do anything, not only for your safety personally, but for the safety of everyone involved? Is that legitimate? If you're concerned about your weight, do you have the right to stop people 
who choose to from going and ordering a pizza, from drinking a soda, from getting extra salt on their food. They're not hurting you. They haven't done anything to you. Why should they be punished? Can you honestly say that the fact that people patronize a business that sells fatty, salty food, high caloric food, are guilty of heart disease? Can you really say that a person who goes and buys a handgun or a shotgun or a rifle that they're guilty of committing mass murder that they never that even though they never did anything and people say i can't imagine a reason for you to own these certain types of guns i can't imagine why someone would want to and pe many people who say this uh, they use very imprecise terms and it's clear they're not exactly sure what they're talking about they'll say fully automatic they'll say machine guns they'll say assault weapons um you know well, the burden of proof isn't on me, right? If you're going to say that I shouldn't be allowed to do something, if you're going to infringe on my freedoms, then the burden of proof is on you. And what I can and can't do should not be limited by your imagination or your preferences. You don't think that I should be able to do that. So what? Who, who gives you the right to have that kind of sway, to have that kind of influence? Why is that your prerogative? Would you agree if the, t t if the roles were reversed and my preferences could dictate to you? I don't think that you should be able to drink. You should not be allowed to have a martini. You shouldn't be able to, to go to the club. Why? Well, you could kill me in a car accident. You could get drunk and kill me in a car accident that, that same night. Outlandish? Look at the numbers. Look at the numbers. You shouldn't be allowed to drive. You could kill me. Right? And here's the other interesting thing about that. All this fuss is made about these certain types of weapons. It's the same as making a fuss about Lamborghinis and car accidents. Right? Why is all the focus on, on weapons that are such a small sliver? You know, if, if somebody said, I'm really upset about all the road traffic fatalities, we need to ban the importation of Lamborghinis, that person probably really is not interested in car safety. They probably have some vendetta against Lamborghini or Italian cars or imports or something like that. And if you're talking about, well, we shouldn't allow 50 cals, well, 50 cals have never been used in a crime, so far as we know. If you're talking about semi-automatic rifles, they're almost never used in crimes. Just this one little thing. Shotguns are used more often. Regular hunting rifles are used more. Handguns are used more. Why all the emphasis on this from a policy, common sense policy position? Why does it make sense to go like this? And now there are people who have potential reasons why that would make sense. None of those reasons have to do with your safety, though. They have to do with a gradualist attempt to restrict firearms and to uh, confiscate them. And the strategy in doing that is to go after guns that aren't as common because they have smaller numbers of people who are willing to defend their use. And so it's an incrementalist approach. And that's why so many hunters and gun supporters who don't even own those types of weapons, that's why a lot of times they won't even budge on that because they realize that it's an incrementalist approach. It's not an approach that makes sense from a crime perspective, we had a assault weapons ban in the United States, and we had background checks. You know, the Brady background that hasn't been around forever. That was instituted in 1994. There's no evidence that it reduced crime. There's no evidence that it reduced gun violence. There's no evidence of that. You can say it's common sense, but we don't really need common sense because there's actually empirical data. We have states that have more restrictive laws that have registrations on everything that people say there's this gun show loophole people say that you know we don't have registration that there there aren't background checks on all purchases there are in california there are in dc there are in illinois all purchases are tracked there now there's not in vermont the home of ted cruz right vermont no 
There's not in Virginia. And it's interesting because people say, yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem. The high, the high crime, these mass shootings that happen in places like California or Illinois or D.C., the reason that happens is because there are other districts around them that, that aren't as strict. But if that's true, then how come those districts don't have even higher crime? How come Virginia isn't more violent than D.C.? How come Indiana isn't more violent than Illinois? How come Oregon isn't more violent than California? Why isn't Vermont more violent than New York? They touch each other. New York has much stronger gun regulations than Vermont does. Which, by the way, Vermont has no gun regulations at the state level. But you'd be safe if you moved there. <laughs> It'd be boring, but you could be you'd be safe. So, you know, if you're going to say we common sense these are going to reduce crime. Says who? So what, what study shows that they do? Because I, I haven't seen it. And people say, oh, the NRA stops the federal government from studying the issue. Well, federal government shouldn't be wasting money on stuff like that. They get studied anyway. Lots of things get studied without the federal government doing it. But here's the other thing. Mass shootings are this tiny sliver. A huge chunk. Possibly a majority of the gun homicides in the United States are related to one thing, and that is the drug war. This is the reason people who compile lists and don't put Mexico next to the United States because it has a much higher homicide rate. They say it's justified to exclude it. It's justified to cherry pick because they have a drug war in Mexico. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. And we have one here too. And that big number of homicides that you see in the United States, a huge chunk of that, probably more than half, is drug war related. It's not a mass shooter bent on killing people. It's not a kid on serotonin and reuptake inhibitors. It's not a fanatic out to get Planned Parenthood. These are a sliver. It's a drug deal gone bad. It's somebody who didn't pay their dealer. It's a dispute between dealers. And that's where the deaths are coming from. And if you're sincere, about gun violence in the United States, if that's really what you were worried about, if that's something that really motivates you on this topic, then you need to address the war on drugs. And the surest way to do that is to decriminalize. And if I meet a gun control person who doesn't come and advance that, if they ignore the majority of the gun deaths and focus on the sliver that they're going to try and go after with gun regulations, then you know that they don't, the gun deaths themselves how, aren't important. It's the gun restrictions that are important. Because legalizing drugs would end the drug war. And it would, I mean, you would still have people who are on drugs who probably committed murders as a result, but the number would be much, much, much smaller. And many Latin American countries have gone this route. Many Latin American countries have suggested, if not even begged, that the United States end the war on drugs for this reason. And I challenge anyone who watches this to tell me that I'm wrong about that and that ending the war on drugs is a stupid idea when it comes to gun control. I mean, we, again, we have this, oh, well, Jamaica has really high homicide, but it's not because they have a gun ban. It's it's for other social reasons. and. And but then they go to the United States and they say, oh, no, no, the only reason homicide's high in the United States, it must be because gun availability. Like, no. And, and, and I failed to mention the United States is not the only country that has a large amount of gun availability and a high per capita gun ownership. There are other countries that do. And some of them have very low homicide rates. Switzerland, Israel, Canada. Canada isn't as liberal as the United States when it comes to guns. But it's pretty liberal. It's pretty easy to get a gun in Canada, most types. They even had an experiment with a gun registry that had no effect on crime. Crime went up. 
and I'm not attributing the, the reason is because of the gun registry, the long gun registry, but they have high gun ownership. They don't have high crime. Czech Republic, Finland. You know, even even France. France does have a low homicide rate. They have, they have mass shootings still. Apparently, their ban on semi-automatic rifles did not seem to stop the shooters in these events. But they have a high per capita gun ownership ship rate, as did Germany. And that means that there's even less correlation than people tend to think. Israel, I already mentioned Israel, but like it's, it bears to be repeated. Very, very heavily armed society and a very peaceful one in terms of gun violence, in terms of the number of homicides. Yes, they have terrorist attacks in Israel. They tend to not be very lethal most of the time, but even when they are, it doesn't make much of a dent in the statistics. So that's the common sense approach. Common sense approach means you end the war on drugs, and that's the first thing. And if that doesn't work, then we talk about other things, you know. But it doesn't make sense to pin all your hopes on the government protecting you. And it doesn't make sense to criminalize people who have done you no harm or done nothing wrong to you. It doesn't make sense to do that. It takes more. If you're really worried about your safety, you have to take responsibility for it. I remember seeing an interview with Bill Clinton, and, and he was asked, what are, what are the merits of the Republican Party? And I hate the fucking Republican Party. But he said the one thing that they have that's valid, that's profound, is that you ultimately are more responsible for yourself than the government. If you are going to wait for the government to do anything, whether it's to educate you or to take care of you, whether in terms of health or income or caloric intake or anything or to protect you, you're doomed. You're doomed. It's never, it's not going to, even if it's benevolent, it doesn't have the resources, it doesn't have the, the knowledge, it doesn't have the, the attention, it doesn't, it's not going to be looking at you to take care of you. It's police are not your bodyguards. They're not going to be there. And we see like, there are places you could go in the United States where the chances that the police are going to be there are basically zero because they're very rural or they're very isolated and you don't have mass shootings there. Why don't people go to campgrounds, you know, way out where the nearest cop is five hours away or whatever? Why? Why don't they, why do they go to a city that's crawling with police where the, re the response is going to be much faster? Because it's not fast enough. Because they're not a magic force field as as many hypotheticals as you can throw in the way of why having a gun for personal self-defense might not work there's that many and more for why the police won't be able to protect you and what's the common sense reply to that well you shouldn't be allowed to protect yourself that those people on gun saves lives those videos that you saw that those people were wrong that they shouldn't have done that, that they should have allowed themselves to be killed, that they should have placed themselves at the mercy of a criminal, that that is the thing that they should do. Rather than saying, hey, they have not only gotten rid of a violent person, either because they killed them or because they subdued them, but they've also created a deterrent for other would-be criminals. How much of a deterrent? It's hard to measure. Definitely it would be absurd, though, to suggest that it's zero, that it has no effect. So I don't expect this video to sway people. I think this is something that people have to vis viscerally grow over time and realize that it's not such a simple thing. It's not enough to look at Japan and look at the United States and say, hey, look, it's different. And we know the reason. You don't know the reason. You don't know the reason. I don't know the reason. Like, crime, is, it's a fascinatingly complex subject and it doesn't correlate with gun laws and they're useful guns have a purpose maybe you don't want one maybe you don't think you need one and maybe you don't need one but that doesn't give you the right to tell others that they don't either that they should be made a criminal that they're wrong that they're culpable right that a person who buys AR-15, and you know what? You can use an AR-15. You can use a semi-automatic weapon. 
they're used millions of times every year to not hurt anyone, to shoot targets, to shoot game. And yeah, sometimes for self-defense. That's legitimate. Using an AR-15 to defend yourself, and I don't even really like AR-15s, but using an AR-15 to defend yourself is a legitimate use of an AR-15. Using it to go out to the range and shoot pop cans, that's a legitimate use of an AR-15. You didn't hurt anybody by doing that. And they don't have to meet to the standard of what your favorite, you know, what you can imagine. You, you can't, you can't pre-crime it and say, what if that person decides to go and kill someone? Right? Didn't you ever see that Time Cruise movie with Minority Report? It's even worse. It's saying we don't know that we don't even know that you're going to do something wrong, but let's just assume that you are. You're guilty in my eyes. Does that really? Is that really make sense? I think not. So. I'm sure that this will be a topic that comes up again and again and again and again. But for those of you who don't agree with me, and I know most of the people who watch this are going to be people who do, but for those of you who don't, just try and keep an open mind and realize that it's not enough to say something's common sense and assert that it's axiomatic and that there can't be any debate and actually have there be something that's that certain and that axiomatic. And that beyond debate because very few things meet that standard and gun control is certainly not one of them so anyway i'll talk to you all later and uh, have a good day